Hello, my name is Joris Malta. And my name is Daniel Gross. And the main theme of our presentation will be that uh, data is not information, and information in turn is not knowledge. And the special thing about information graphics is uh, that you can zoom out to see a broader picture, but you can zoom in at the same time to see every single detail. ก็ชื่อคุณยอริสมาลซาและคุณแดนิเอลกรอสนะคะจาก Catalog Tree Studio ค่ะซึ่งก็เป็นสตูดิโอนะคะที่ทำงานออกแบบหลากหลายสาขาจากเมืองอาร์เนมประเทศเนเธอร์แลนด์และกรุงเบอร์ลินนะคะประเทศเยอรมนีซึ่งก็จะเชี่ยวชาญนะคะด้านการออกแบบข้อมูลและสนใจระบบการจัดการตัวเองของคอมพิวเตอร์โดยเชื่อในความคิดที่ว่ารูปแบบเท่ากับพฤติกรรมค่ะ so Are you guys ready to start off this afternoon session with our first two speakers? If you are, please welcome Mr. Joris Malta and Mr. Daniel Gross from Catalog Tree. Hello. Let me put my bottle of water down first. Um, Uh, I'd, first, I'd like to I'd like to thank the TCDC for inviting us. It's been uh, it's been a wonderful stay uh, so far, um, and especially we like to thank you for taking such good care of us these uh, these past few days. Um, so we're Catalog Tree. We're a very small graphics design studio based in Arnhem in the Netherlands, and in, uh, we have a second studio in Berlin, uh, which is led by Nina Bender, our third partner. Um, And we specialize in, in what is called information design. We often get asked the question, what that actually is. You know, isn't all graphic design information design? You know, if you design someone's business card, there's usually information on it. Or if you design a poster, there's information on it. So what is the difference? Um, when you work with data, um, something else comes in play. Uh, because data is not information. And information, in turn, is not knowledge. Um, we try to get to that uh, later a bit. But when, when you want to get from uh, data to information, you have, take, have to take certain editorial steps. You have to, um, let's say, reorganize the data. You have to um, uh, filter it and make choices, editorial choices, um, in order to draw a story out of the data. Um, in other words, we're not only concerned with the tone of voice of a project, let's say the stylistic aspects of it, you know, what is the, the colors that are being used or the typefaces or maybe the um, uh, uh, composition and things like that. But we're also concerned with what it is that we are actually saying. So our studio usually gets into projects where we get real early into, um, uh, into a project, working together with other people, um, not only discussing about what the end product might be, but also what is the content of the project. Um, we will, of course, show some examples of that. But l first, let me briefly uh, explain what is uh, flickering here on the screen. About a year ago, we were in Sao Paulo, uh, in Brazil, and um, we quickly learned that uh, Sao Paulo has the highest density of helicopter landing platforms in the world. Um, there's more uh, helicopter landing platforms or helipads in Sao Paulo than you have in the entire uh, United Kingdom. There's a lot. And um, people told us that there's a, a whole new class of the super rich that fly into the city from outside and land on their, um, on their office building, whatever. They go do a day's of work, then go into their helicopter again, fly to the next uh, building and go to the gym or do some shopping or whatever, what super rich people do at the end of the day. And then they fly out of the city again. So they don't touch the ground anymore. They're not actually not on the street, never, because they, they just fly in with a helicopter. We were really interested in this. Well, you know, we thought it was a fascinating story, so we thought we, maybe we can see a glimpse of that life, and we wanted to um, uh, draw a map, and we couldn't, we couldn't find any maps or any lists of where these places were, and so we wrote an algorithm that can detect um, heli 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 helipads uh, from satellite footage, because we thought Um, helipads are always square, and they're always blue, and they always have a white triangle. Um, at the end of our talk, we would like to share our conclusions from that uh, research. Um, but cities are very interesting to us, and this, uh, the urban landscape especially. Uh, you know, more than half of the people on this planet live in cities. 
Um, and this number is growing rapidly. And to accommodate that massive migration that is taking place in the past 40 years, we've built as much urban fabric as we've done in the past 10,000 years of human history. So this is really complex. This is a huge issue that is going on. If we want to find answers to big global problems, you know, like uh, climate change or um, poor uh, distribution of wealth across the globe, maybe it, the best place to look for answers is cities, because that's where, where everyone is, you know. Um, so recently, in recent projects, we've, we've been able to work together with uh, architects and uh, city planners uh, and researchers uh, who are looking for answers in this, uh, in this direction. So one project um, that we'd like to start off with is, is this here. It's a part of an exhibition the, uh, of the International uh, Architectural Biennale in Rotterdam in 2014, where we looked at the city as a metabolism. So not so much as a place where there's buildings, but as a place of flows, people flowing in and out of the city, food flowing in and out, uh, water, waste, air, cargo, uh, energy, uh, and try to uh, create visuals around that. What does that actually look like? Um, we designed a great many, um, um, uh, great many maps and, and, and infographics that show this a little bit, and it was uh, part of this uh, part of this exhibition. This was the, uh, a book which accompanied uh, the exhibition, and um, basically it's a selection of all infographics uh, we did, uh, and again with uh, some text to, play, uh, to explain these a little bit better. But uh, the main challenge we faced here was the fact that all the uh, source data was completely different, and still we had to, to make some choices due to that they communicate with the same tone. So, um, but in our opinion, it's one of the main challenges in, of information design in general, which is often forgot, that the data which is sourced to the information uh, design is often completely inconsistent, incomplete, vague, fuzzy, or messy to the core. So um, this, is a, uh, this is a fact which is often forgot if you look at the end on, on, on the infographic. So, but sometimes data is so complex and so complicated that it's not able to bring the message across. But as soon as it's, uh, um, as it's clamped up, up it's, it's a little bit uh, um, easier to understand. So this is one uh, uh, graphic we did for them. This is, uh, this is the Netherlands, basically. It may not look like, but it's it. So uh, um, these are all uh, um, energy flows through uh, the Netherlands. So uh, the thickness of the line is directly related to uh, the amount of energy. And then there are different energy uh, sources. So you have uh, these fossil fuels, like oil, oil products and crude oil. And the Netherlands are importing all this stuff. But um, at the same moment, they export it. So most of the oil is just floating through the Netherlands and crossing the border again. But if you take a closer look, and you look at these uh, more uh, sustainable energies, like biomass, waste, uh, geothermal energy, solar energy, and wind energy, and you, you follow their path, and you compare it here, in the Netherlands, we throw away nine times more energy by throwing away still heated cooling water than all these sustainable energy sources uh, added up. So this is quite, uh, quite a nice thing to know, but, uh, um, but it was completely hidden underneath the data in, in start because scientists are so used to, to uh, communicate based on, on numbers and figures. But our task is really to, 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 to visualize these that they are able to tell a story. So the, uh, these are some pages of the book where um, uh, parts of uh, the Netherlands are explained. And uh, yeah. and here, so basically it came down that we are not doing only the infographics or the info design for the book, but and to develop a kind of a language where all these uh, different data sources can speak with the same tone, that they are understandable and uh, capable of telling a story. Right, so another book that we, uh, that we recently designed um, together with the curator of that exhibition, Dirk Simons, 
um, is about the transition of uh, um, uh, the generation of energy uh, from fossil fuels to more sustainable uh, sources and the way that might impact our landscape and the urban landscape. Um, this book has, a, has a very nice cover because it's very unsustainable glow-in-the-dark ink. It's a nice effect, isn't it? But it really glows in the dark, right? <laughs> it's, it's it glows in the dark. <laughs> yeah. So when we so got it back from the printer, we instantly ran into the toilet, sort of closed the door <laughs> behind us, and it, ooh, 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 look at that. <laughs> it glows in the dark, you know, it's sure. fantastic. Anyway, so this, the, the, the <laughs> yeah, you can tell me the joke later. Yeah? <laughs> um, uh, the idea behind this book is that um, uh, that Dirk Simons and his company HNS Landscape Architects had is that they wanted to see what what might uh, uh, happen to a polder in the ne Netherlands. The image you see there is a polder north of Amsterdam. Um, if you were to generate energy in that space for one million homes, um, and they created these uh, uh, photo montages to uh, to show that, um, so. What you see here on the left uh, is uh, the impact of nuclear energy on the landscape. And it's really not that much. It's really difficult to detect, but um, uh, there's a, a little white plume. Yeah, can you point <laughs> it out on the screen, Daniel? Here. Make, make, the, make the people of the lights nervous about, about <laughs> whether to switch on or off the light. So there's a, 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 little, um, a little dot in the landscape that, uh, um, that indicates that there's a, a nuclear power plant. Uh, of course, the f geographical footprint of a power plant, uh, power plant is not that problematic, but the, the, um, the waste that comes from it is, uh, uh, is problematic for many, many years. So maybe it would be better to switch to solar or, or wind power. Um, and this is the image that you see on the right. From this height, you don't see any um, um, uh, turbines. But there are other sources that have a huge impact on the landscape. Like here on the left, you see what the landscape might look like if you were to grow uh, biomass to uh, burn, basically, to, to create energy. You know, if you, if, you burn, if you make a wood fire, you're burning biomass. And you need nine times the size of that uh, polder to um, generate energy for a million homes. And on the right-hand side, it's tar sands. It's sand that is saturated with oil, and then after a very um, polluting chemical process, the oil and the sand are separated, and you, then you have fuel to burn. But as you can see, this completely ruins everything. We added a uh, graphic to that, because one million homes isn't the same across the globe. You know, there's uh, um, big differences between cities. Um, as you can see here, the biggest circle is one million homes in Los Angeles, where the middle circle is one million homes in Istanbul, and the smallest is one million homes in Mumbai. So this means that, that well, of course, we know that population density differs. But what is interesting to think about is that to generate energy for this, uh, this population, sometimes you need much, much more space than these people actually occupy by living. And this is not only true for the generation of energy, but it also uh, uh, counts for um, growing crops or maybe getting water, drinking water out of the ground. You need much more space than just a place where you're living uh, outside. Then we work together with uh, Nicolas de Monchot. It's uh, another, another atlas, the last one that we're, that we're going to show. It's... Um, uh, actually a city atlas of uh, three major American cities, uh, New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And um, the book shows research by Nicholas de Monchot, who is an associate professor at uh, Berkeley in, uh, in California, and uh, um, associate professor in architecture. Um, the book was very recently, only two weeks ago or three weeks ago, was published by Princeton Architectural Press in New York. Um, and what Nicholas de Monchot has done is not co to come up with one big design that could uh, change uh, or um, uh, change these kind of issues for the better, um, but to look for uh, very small spots in the in the city where you could make uh, little changes. He looked for places um, that are underused, basically are abandoned by the city. No money flows there anymore for maintenance, so they're, they're basically just left to ruin. Um, and um, uh, uh, he did this um, 
by collecting enormous amounts of uh, data, not only geographical data about where those places might be, but especially uh, demographic data and social data. Because as it turns out, these underused sites in cities are often uh, embedded in the most vulnerable neighborhoods. So if you look for places where crime rates are high, or unemployment is high, or health figures are low, um, you're, likely to use, you're likely to find places that um, are, uh, are underused. Um, one example of that is um, spots like these, uh, owned by billboard companies. In, uh, this is in Los Angeles, a street scene in Los Angeles. And what the billboard company does is they buy a little plot of land next to uh, a highway or, uh, or a train line or something like that. And um, they place a, they fence it off and they place a billboard there. And, uh, f you know, so, so, so many, many people can see it, but it's not, not used for anything else. And of course, this is only a little plot of land. If you look at that from above, it's, not, uh, it's really not that, uh, that much. We can turn to the, mm -hmm. to the next. Uh, it's really not that much, it's just a little, little plot of land. But because de Monchot collected so much data, he could identify thousands of these places. Um, and not only, uh, these, these are uh, locations in Los Angeles, but he also uh, detected thousands of uh, heat islands in New York, for instance, um, and flooding areas in, uh, in San Francisco. Um, and because he knew so much, not so much, uh, or he knew so much about the, uh, the surroundings, you know, what kind of people live there and what are their needs, he could also predict or design a possible scenario for these locations. You know, maybe there should be a public park there because it might be a, a site in New York that is actually a heat island, you know, a place that would never cool down anymore in the, in the summer and where temperatures get so high that it actually uh, has a really a negative influence on, uh, on public health. Um, or maybe there's educational issues or something like that, and it should be a public library. Um, so all of these uh, scenarios were generated uh, dynamically, and now we have all of a sudden thousands of micro solutions for very small places. But because they're, so, um, uh, they're in such vulnerable neighborhoods, they can have a really big impact of these, of, on, uh, on these communities. So for the book, uh, uh, de Monchot made a really small selection of all his plants, about 4,000, and then uh, um, asked us to design the book. But uh, we only had uh, 240 pages, so it, it was quite a lot to put on these pages, and he wanted to reserve about 100 pages for his own text, which I give a more <laughs> broad insight on the, on the subject. So we decided to, to, to program the rest of the book because otherwise it's, it, it's a little bit too, too much work also for us. We are, we are kind of lazy somewhat. And um, so we wrote an algorithm that, um, that is able to design the spreads automatically uh, for us. So it's, um, it's putting uh, um, uh, maps of sites where the impact is high, where the pressure also is high to change something, bigger on the spread than the other ones. So it's, it's making not only a selection, but it's also adding some weight to it. Because if we would have placed these with the same size each, it would be a very boring story to tell. And uh, the uh, algorithm also sorted these from, uh, from west to east. So you can browse through the book, and by browsing through the book, you browse uh, through the uh, sites uh, in a geographical correct way. So um, this then was automatically implemented. And um, this is how the book likes. At least uh, the pages do look like with, uh, with the maps on it. So uh, maps where the pressure was high or the, it's a pressing problem are uh, getting bigger and uh, other ones are getting smaller. So um, if you zoom in, uh, you see these and, they, and the captions are uh, placed automatically and they, uh, we had different captions according to the size of the, uh, of the maps. Then these are the introduction uh, pages uh, Monsieur wrote to, to uh, give a broader view. And the, uh, the book is uh, published right now. So it, uh, it came out a month ago, right? It's uh, yeah, on uh, like Princeton that. Architect Perth. And um, it's, an, it's still an ongoing project. So uh, it was also featured in uh, Architectural Biennale Triennale in, uh, in Portugal. 
and uh, there's a website we made also for this project and um, it's going on right now. What we want to show next is a, is a picture we really do like. It's, a, it's again, it's uh, the Netherlands. It's the southern part of the uh, Netherlands. And it was shot around 2006, so it's, a, it's an older picture. But uh, uh, what you can see here is, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice piece of design, but it, it's not designed by a designer, actually. It, it, it was designed by a young man who has led the, the sports car of his uh, dad, and then he drank a lot of alcohol. And cocaine, and, then, and cocaine, don't yeah, forget took the a lot cocaine. of drugs. <laughs> and then just drove off. Which is, which is not really a good idea, of course. But uh, and, uh, quite soon he was, because of his driving style, he was uh, uh, followed by the police agents. And, uh, and then the man had this almost ingenious idea to, to try to escape the police agents by entering a cornfield. So cornfields are quite high, so you can hide a car in it. And the man just drove on the cornfield and tried almost frantically to, uh, try to, to escape the police agents there. But what he didn't knew, and what the uh, policeman w knew, was that there was only one single exit. <laughs> oh, it's, it's exit. It's all uh, um, <laughs> But uh, there was only one single exit. And uh, um, they just stood there and wait. So actually, <laughs> no person was purchasing or following, uh, following uh, the man anymore. But still, he drove there for about half an hour, <laughs> and then came here, sweating all over, and drove the car into a ditch, caused total loss to his dad's car, was arrested by the police, and they drove off. But what remains was a kind of uh, um, quite drastical uh, damage to the field, but also, in our opinion, a, a, a really, really nice infographic. Because if people talk about infographics, they always quite fastly uh, think about pie charts and bar charts and all these things. But it, there's an interesting thing about infographics. So as soon as you have correct data, if, you're, if the data is reliable and well sorted, it's really easy to make an infographic. So you, yeah, you basically could draw a pie chart. But um, if the data is randomized, if it's, if it's fuzzy data, if it's unreliable data, it's really hard to find an, a, a fitting translation for that kind of data. So how would an infographic for paranoia look like, for example? That's a really hard answer to a, a question to answer. And we think this is a perfect uh, infographic, for example, paranoia. So it's, it's made by, and even better, it's made by a non-designer without knowing that he's designing anything. So it's yeah, get, yeah, get the designers uh, out. That's, uh, so uh, uh, we knew that picture. Uh. And uh, uh, years later, um, we were asked to do an exhibition design for Vitra Design Museum in Germany. And uh, they had the idea to, to make an exhibition and to uh, ask uh, um, Dutch uh, product designers to collaborate with German firms. And at that time, when the project started, we imagined basically chaos. Because if you ask a Dutch product designer to collaborate with somebody else in Germany, for example, and it could end in chaos. And we were proven, <laughs> and we were proven right. So, it's, uh, um, so we tried to come up with a, uh, uh, with a fitting translation of, uh, of chaos, basically. So we didn't want to make them a kind of nice looking logo, but we wanted to have a, a, yeah, a nice translation of chaos. So, and we also did do some. Do you want to do the honors? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, and we want to have more of Yuri in this room because yeah. we're very sorry that he's not here. And, so and we, we also did some really <laughs> rapid prototyping. So it's um, <laughs> so because we knew about a, a, a nice experiment to to show chaos, and I want to share this with you right now. So, um, where's the camera? <laughs> Yeah, I showed you. And uh, um, so um, this is a pendulum, right? It, it's uh, it's really easy. So if the pendulum swings, even for us, it's it's uh, quite easy to predict where the pendulum will be in the next second. So it, because it's uh, it's harmonic and and so on. There, yeah, it's quite easy. But um, if you attach a second pendulum to the first one, you get a double pendulum, and then you get a kind of 
Now, it doesn't work at all, but it's, it's, it's showing the principle. <laughs> the, uh, the movement gets chaotic. So it's not, you're not able to predict even the next second of the movement of that pendulum. It's, it's uh, because it's, it's complete chaos. Um, but the, uh, the good thing about it is that it's, it's, you're not able to predict it, but you can program it. So, and this is what we did. Uh, um, we made a, um, oh yeah, we have to go wait. Oh, you have to, we have to wait for the, um, for the slide. We uh, switch back to the, ah, yeah. Uh, wait, hang on. So, um, if you imagine uh, um, these two red dots you see right now as these two euro coins here and here, you get a, a, a pattern like this. But every time you, you start this animation again, it's creating a completely different pattern. But the nice thing about that one is that uh, all these patterns kind of look like the same, but they are not. They are family of each other, but they are not the same. And uh, these patterns we used for, for all their uh, uh, um, print uh, campaign. So every time they, did a, they had something to print, we used a different logo. So because it's, yeah, it's not one logo, there are, there are thousands or, or more than that. But because it's Vitra, and we were a little bit uh, uh, dissatisfied that they asked us for the exhibition design because we wanted to do something, uh, we also, uh, to, uh, we also uh, started to uh, make a mechanical device which is uh, uh, showing that principle. So uh, we made this clock, and it's a, it's, a, it's a normal gear clock, basically, and you have to wind it up. So we have these uh, Swiss uh, Zig bottles, and they are filled with lead, and you, you have to wind up the clock. So it's, uh, um, as you can see here, it's uh, the upper part of the clock. And then if we uh, take a look at the film, it's, uh, um, so here you see the double pendulum, the next pendulum, and the, uh, the weight. But the, uh, the interesting thing about that clock is because the pendulum itself is moving chaotically, and the pendulum in every proper gear clock is uh, um, uh, uh, synchronizing the clock. You never know if this clock is running right or if it's running wrong. So every time you look at the clock, you can read the time, you can read the time, but you do not know if it's right or wrong. And handy, huh? <laughs> Which is really handy. <laughs> which is, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little bit the same than when refrigerator. So if you open the door, you, the light is on inside, but you do not know if it's on before. And um, so, uh, and when we, um, this was the, uh, and because we also did the exhibition design for for their show, we made this the centerpiece of all. And uh, um, you see here, it's a, it's a pendulum, and here's the uh, second one. And um, we are not really interactive designers, but this was by far the most interactive piece we did ever. <laughs> because, because the clock is always running wrong, right? But maybe it's, it's running exactly right. But there were always men standing here fiddling uh, the clock hands to make it run right. So it was damaged after a week. But, uh, um, but still, we really do like this, uh, this device because it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's nice to show that kind of principle. Okay. But so we also uh, do yeah, some print yeah. design we want to show now. Yeah, and also, also we, want to, we want to have a little break ourselves, so let someone else do the talking then. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Trish from Fold Factory and welcome to the 200th episode of Fold of the Week. I cannot believe I've been doing 50 episodes a year for four years. It's hard to believe. It's kind of gone by in a flash. Um, you know, it's very funny, uh, much like my 100th episode, there's a lot of pressure um, to do something really exciting and interesting for my 200th episode. Do I throw confetti? Do I go platinum blonde and surprise everybody? I don't know. Well, I decided to just you know, keep it real and do what I do best and show a really amazing format for my 200th episode. And this one is epic, it's off the hook, it's one of the neatest things I've ever seen. Um, I'm gonna give you a few quick stats and then I'm gonna tell you all about it. Um, this is for University of Toronto's School of Architecture. This was designed by Catalog Tree in the Netherlands and also produced in the Netherlands. Um, paper is Pioneer 80 pound text. 
and they did about 3,500 of these. This folding style is called the Mira Ori. I have never seen it in commercial application. I've only seen this as concepts um, in white paper, basically, mock-ups and things. So I was absolutely floored to see this in application, and um, it's fascinating. So here's how it works. So this is what it looks like when it's closed. Okay, and the nature of this fold, I'll give you a little history, but um, is that it opens in one smooth movement and closes in one smooth movement into a poster, basically. So watch this. Take a look <laughs> at that. I'm going to yeah. show you the back because it's a little easier to see the folded, uh, you know, where the folds are and the scores. But it's wonderful, too, because this was for a school of art, uh, architecture, and that was part of the concept behind why they used this format. So it just closes up in one movement as well. So, so cool. So a little bit of history on this. Um, this folded format it was um, created by and named after a Japanese astrophysicist. It was developed specifically for solar panel arrays on um, Japanese satellites. And it's actually uh, called rigid origami when they use uh, rigid materials and hinges to mimic the um, movement of paper. And so when you apply, you know, they applied this to solar panels, but then they also can apply it to paper. So um, just fascinating. So these were um, printed, scored, hand folded. Um, as I said, they did 3,500 of them. Um, just amazing. This is part of a poster series, actually, that they produce at University of Toronto. Um, I just think it's one of the most amazing <laughs> formats I've seen. So I hope you like it. That is your 60 Second Super Cool Fold of the Week. I want to take a moment to thank my longtime sponsors of Fold of the Week, Sappy Fine Paper. I don't know what I would do without them. They're a wonderful company. Um, I also want to thank all my Fold Factory sponsors um, for supporting me and for all my viewers who view, come back every week and share um, my videos. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. Um, so 60 Second Fold of the Week, Mira Ori. Forward this to your friends and colleagues. Keep the dialogue going. And viewers, please send me your folds. If I use them, I'll send you free stuff. Visit FullFactory.com for more ideas and inspiration. And remember, think finishing at the beginning. I'll see you next week. Bye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. maybe, maybe, maybe invite her next time. Yeah. So, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, not at which episode is she now? At 362, right? 67. 67. Oh. It's incredible. That's uh, Trish Witowski. She's she's doing she's doing this forever. Uh, sorry uh, to the translator. She were not prepared for that uh, <laughs> little add-on. All right. Um, geez, we're really fast now. Huh? We're already uh, up to our up to our last uh, last project that we want we'll to show. Talk really um, slow. Yeah, we will talk really slow. <laughs> um, so this uh, this video was taken by uh, a friend of ours, uh, Hans Gremme, uh, very nice graphic designer from the Netherlands. And he was traveling by car in the, the U.S. And he told us, told us that he was in Mawa in New Jersey, which is um, uh, up north from New York, New York City. And, um, and we said, oh yeah, if you're there, can you go and film the New York Stock Exchange for us? Because it's there. The building that you just see over the, um, uh, over the greens over there, that's, that's actually the New York Stock Exchange. Um, there's no plate saying that there's no there's no nothing that indicates that the New York Stock Exchange is in Mawa in New Jersey even if you would if you would call the New York Stock Exchange and say you know what's your address they would they would never give you this particular location it's um, uh, well, it's not so much classified but they they're not they're not really um, open about it um, and we wanted to uh, or we were interested in this because we were working on a, uh, a project at that time uh, about high frequency trading. Um, we were working together with uh, a documentary maker, Marije Meerman from the Netherlands, and she's working uh, there for uh, Dutch Public Television. And she had been working in the field of, uh, of making documentaries uh, about the financial world, and her next project she wanted to do on high frequency trading. Um, we thought, Daniel and me, not completely being oblivious about fin the financial world and, and what stock trade actually is, thought that um, this is what stock trading is. You know, this is, this is uh, Wall Street, an Im image of Wall Street, and that stock trade goes as follows. You put on a funny, funny colored jacket, 
and you're full of testosterone, and then you start shouting your orders and be really stressed and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and make a lot of money. Um, but we quickly learned that Wall Street is actually a museum. There's hardly any trading going on there anymore because all the trading is being done by computers. Right? There's algorithms that uh, decide when to buy or share and, or, or sell stock. Um, this has major uh, consequences to, to the way things work in the, in the world because the computers that run these algorithms aren't your everyday uh, PCs, the really, really expensive big machines that literally only a handful of companies in the world can uh, afford. And this means that the majority of trading is, being, uh, is controlled, basically, by a very, very small amount of people, which is a bit of a disconcerting thought to us. Um, another thing that is changing because of this development is that when you hear about you know, emotions in the market, you know, like um, there's uncertainty or there's fear or something like that, it's, you know, it's only partially true because the, the algorithms don't care. You know, they just uh, uh, figure out or try to figure out when to buy or sell stock. You know, they have no emotions. Um, another thing is that it is tremendously fast. You know, when we were doing this project, the speed was about 3,000 transactions a second, which is a thousand times faster than you can blink your eye. And by now, they're doing this by 6,000 transactions a second or something like that. Um, so the documentary was to be an interactive documentary special for iPad, um, which was not released at that time in the, in the Netherlands, but uh, we still wanted to work do something for this. Um, it's a 60-minute documentary that you can download and has all kinds of uh, um, uh, add-ons. Um, and we wanted to explain this. How, how does high frequency work, actually? But then, on May 6, in 2010, there was a flash crash on the Dow Jones uh, in America, one of, the, um, uh, uh, one of the indexes. And in seven and a half minutes or something, $800 billion were lost which is like the you know, economy of a reasonable country. Sort of in seven minutes, it was gone. And then after 20 minutes, it sort of gradually came back. But when that happened, and we were right in the middle of this, this project, we thought, no, you know, this is, this is what we should try to uh, t talk about. This is, this is what we should, uh, should do. So Marije Meerman, the documentary maker, she went out to London and New York to uh, interview traders and analysts and uh, who were uh, witnesses uh, of this event that day. Um, and we were giving the, the actual tick data of, the, uh, of all the trades that were going on. Or not all of it, because then you would need one of those gigantic computers. But from uh, specific shares, um, we were given the full data of the, of the entire day. So we could make visualizations about this. Um, and this led them to this, um, uh, this uh, app that we created. We want to show a small clip of, to give you a bit of an idea of the atmosphere of the, uh, of the documentary. Where, where are you on May 6, 2010? Uh, here working. Um, May 6, 2010, yes, I was, I was here. One eye on the market. When I on my own profits and losses, uh, and then my ears and mouth doing whatever else they have to do. It was the first really down day that we had in a while. And the market basically looks like it's going to go to hell that day. It wasn't just minutes later. It was just it was Armageddon. Oh my God! Here you go. I'm told it's 835. The Dow ticker. Wow. I feel like when the Dow hit nearly down a thousand points, you're like. Really? 87 even start trading, 86 even start trading, 85 even start trading, here my guys, all the I saw days that panic, you know, I think then, then I started watching CNN or one of those channels. So. What we're seeing right now, I mean, it, it, it maybe, I, I believe maybe I'm pressing edge, you're not, talk about capitulation, let's take a look at P&G. They're gonna probably halt trading, we can't stop the selling. So you've got the general picture, the, the big picture, although it's still over a very short time scale, and then you've got the detailed picture of um, the individual trades. See, there's a little bump there. That's almost the, the more natural um, scale, whereas even here at this level, it's something that seems to be quite big. So there are some trades that are kind of normal, and then there's... there's yes, yeah, funny, these, these big... They, they, you're right, they, these are really big, aren't they? 
but this one goes, it starts off at 42 and it goes all the way down to one, <laughs> one cent. Lord above, it's amazing. Oh my gosh, I, I turned away and that happened. So who is it selling Accenture at five cents? It has to be a machine, right? Yeah. Essentially, they're just rocketing back and forth between. Yeah. You know, only a machine can do those, right? Yeah. Any thoughts of um, what's going on here? Steve Jobs didn't die. There's no reason for Apple to be falling to zero. Right. And so they start trading. And then, I mean, the, the back up in, what, seven and a half minutes or something, it was incredible. And that what, couldn't have been people not right. reacting that quickly and not in that kind of volume. Well, one key thing is how automated is all of this, all of these, these trades? Uh, and that's when the delay started a few hundred milliseconds and then a few seconds and then five seconds and then ten seconds. And then some of them went all the way to 36 seconds. So the delay in the data was 36 seconds. Right, but the way that the timestamps occur is it hi hid the delay, so you couldn't see it. The Dow Jones, it was actually should have been here. The real price was here. The delay in the system caused it to appear like it was over here. So when people were seeing the Dow dropping, this uh, was actually really where the market was at that moment in time. We operate on this time scale where, you know, where five minutes is pretty fast. You could go out for a cup of coffee and come back and find that you'd lost a billion dollars. That's, that's, that would ruin, you know, ruin your day. And, and uh, yet for these computers operating in microseconds, it makes, it makes no difference. So I think it's the circuit breakers is a case of sort of in imposing our time scale on the computing time scale. Could it happen again? Um, the same mechanism that caused it on May 6th is still there. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, so it happens again and again, but then not, not at that magnitude. So um, every week or so or every month, do you see these little dips? And what goes on is that many many shares are sold very very rapidly causing a, a little delay in the system and by that the same share can be uh, uh, has different prices in different platforms so you can buy it if you have a really fast computer you can buy it for a low price and sell it for a high price instantane instantaneously so that's um, uh, uh, someone is making making money with that uh, system but what we did with this uh, uh, documentary, there's all this, these interviews and everything in it, um, but the visualizations that we created were already finished before the entire app was finished. So when Mariah did those interviews, she could take them uh, with her and have these experts uh, discuss uh, them and try to explain what is going on. And maybe this ties in a little bit with what we said earlier, that data is not information and that information is not knowledge, is that when you have the information, that doesn't really mean that you understand it, right? If you, if you know that Wikipedia is full of information, that doesn't exactly make you wise. You know, you still have to invest time uh, and make an effort to understand. Um, and this is, this is what we were able to do, is that we could have the experts talk to you while you were watching these, uh, these animations. Another thing is on a more um, uh, technical level is that, of course, we had the, we had the entire day of data. Um, and you cannot really uh, ask people to download an entire day of video uh, from the App Store, right? So what we did is that we uh, only uploaded the, the, the actual data and um, uh, any animations were created on the fly. We think that's really cool, but everyone else always thinks, yeah, well, so, you know, so what? But you know, we really like that. Uh, the fact that you uh, that you that you can do that. So here's uh, Procter and Gamble in uh, turmoil. This is an aerial view, which is a little bit older, and it's uh, it's uh, it's showing exactly the same location we show we have shown in the beginning, and it's a New York Stock Exchange in in Mawa, New Jersey, and um, so um, basically it's there to to provide a kind of real time backup for all things which are happening there. So uh, um, this place at that time was still empty. So you see this uh, this uh, vacant place, and this is the location uh, Goldman and Sachs uh, uh, um, uh, used for they, their data center. So they built it right next to their data center, 
And the only reason was that their cable is a little bit shorter. So because if you, have a, if you do have a shorter cable, your, the information arrives a little bit earlier. So um, uh, this is kind of a strange phenomenon, which leads to a, to a, to a, a, to a strange uh, cartography. So here you see Wall Street in the center, and the, the red one is uh, Manhattan Island. And you see this black shape around it. And it has a name. It's, it's called a data donut, because it is a hole in the middle. And um, this is the area where all the data centers are built right now. The outer rim is about 70 kilometers uh, away from the, uh, the center. And the inner rim is about 30 uh, kilometers away from the center. The outer rim is because um, the glass fiber network gets too slow. When uh, uh, there are data centers built outside that area, it's, it's not really a real-time uh, connection anymore. And the inner rim, because it's a donut, the hole, is because they have to take into account that there might be a nuclear attack happening on Manhattan. So you do not want to have your data center built inside the blast radius of an atomic bomb. So that's the reason why, which is kind of abstract to, 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 to think about like that. And then there are even more uh, things uh, which uh, um, make it uh, a little bit difficult to, pay, uh, to, um, to build a data center. For example, if there are a lot of uh, trees in it, if, uh, if it's a swampy area, if, uh, uh, um, if it's uh, flooding zones, if there are rivers uh, nearby, if there are streets uh, nearby because hazardous goods could be transported uh, uh, there, if there are uh, railway uh, lines nearby, if uh, um, you have your uh, data center underneath a flight route, and uh, there are three major airports, so there are a lot of flight routes also. And if you, uh, and you uh, do not want to build your data center next to a nuclear power plant, so there's one in the south and one in the north, and uh, you do not want to build it uh, uh, in uh, places where the crime rate is quite high. So what remains darkish or black right now inside this rim is uh, it's, it's, it's sold very, very expensive. So these places which stayed black, this is a kind of digital Dubai for all real estate managers to, to, to sell these places because they do fulfill on uh, every single aspect uh, you want to have for a data center. And these firms uh, built their data centers there and then they uh, built a second one next to it to, to, as a backup for the backup. And uh, some firms do quadruples, so they build four identical data centers at the size of the, the one as a uh, stock exchange, where um, the other one can be switched on when the rest is damaged or is faulty. But only the really rich companies do that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the, the, this is an example of a visualization that did not make it into, into the app. Um, uh, it just remained a sketch. And what we heard was that it was a rumor that this, uh, this crash was originated by some bad trade or something like that uh, on a platform in Chicago. So what you see here on the screen is uh, all the trading floors, uh, floors in Northern America. And, uh, and all the, we wanted to visualize this somehow like, like you throw a rock in the water or something and then the rig spread out. And uh, we were hoping to, to, to maybe discover some type of pattern in that. Um, so I think that the, the green stands for when the, when the stock goes up and the red stands for when the stock goes down or something like that. And the, the, the magnitude of the ring was the, the volume of the trade or whatever. I can't even really remember. But what, what I do remember was that we, we programmed this quickly just to, just to see. And then we were sitting at the screen sort of, oh, that's really beautiful. And sort of looking at it, oh, this is so beautiful. Ah, oh, it's really good. And we were so happy with this. You know, it's, uh, we made such a beautiful thing. Like, oh, this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is really good. And then after, I don't know, half an hour or so, maybe, maybe we got yeah. a little bit hypnotized also. I don't know what it, what it was. But after half an hour, we thought, yeah, but so where's this bad trade? You know, what, wh where's this story? And we just couldn't, we, we just couldn't find it. I mean, we made other visualizations after did this and tried to draw this, this story out. We just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, and this is to, to sort of illustrate this point that, that even if you have the data, you can, uh, uh, it's, it's not necessarily the case that there is any interesting story in it. 
you know, it's even if the quality of the data is very high, and we had the highest grain of data that you could get on this subject, like tick data, every single transaction with all the information that you can get, um, we couldn't draw any anything out. And then you, you know, you can stick with the beauty, sort of, and say, yeah, it doesn't mean anything, but it's really beautiful, or you have to kick it out. And we, it's, it's the last one, of the, the last thing that we did, so we, we kicked it out. And you know we're still thinking about turning this into a screensaver or something like that for you know for, for people to download for free. Apple Trade number nine hundred, uh, <laughs> whatever it is. So, but let's let's uh, we're nearly really near the end the, the end of our talk. So we wanted to go back to this um, helipad um, uh, algorithm, and it was of course also detecting swimming pools and roofs that are bluish but not. Uh, helipads. We should have asked Kyle McDonald to program it for us. <laughs> um, we didn't have the resources, Kyle. <laughs> maybe, maybe next time, or you could help us out with this. Yes. <laughs> there's um, uh, tennis courts that are blue. But yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot of tennis courts. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's plenty, plenty of tennis courts. Also, it was, it was missing out on, uh, on many, um, um, many of these, uh, of these things. Um, so the only reasonable thing that we could say after after doing this uh, exercise is basically this: that there at that time were 2,165 bluish objects in Sao Paulo, and then uh, we discovered that some of them are red. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot. That's Thank it for you. us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Since there should be an ed editorial process in turning yeah. information into knowledge, how can we be sure that we draw the right conclusion from the information? Yes, yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, of course, yeah. You know, if, if, you, if you talk about data visualization, you often get this, get this um, uh, into a conflict with the objectivity. You know, there's, you could say that uh, a, data sh a data set should be represented as objective as, objective as possible. Um, we tend to not agree with that um, so much. It might work for a small data set. You know, if you have uh, a top 10 of best-selling books or something like that, um, you might, you know, you better keep it just simply as a list, you know, like that. Um, but if you have a really large data set, we think that that, that line of, of, of thinking um, really uh, um, drives at reproducing the exact data set again. And if you have tens of thousands of data points, um, this makes interpretation really difficult. So... <laughs> <laughs> You're Donald yeah, Trump. They told me to. You're sort of <laughs> standing behind, behind me. <laughs> um, so that makes interpretation really difficult. You know, the, the, um, uh, you have to... Uh, take the audience with you and sort of point at certain things and say, this is really important, you have to pay attention to this. But what we try to do in our visualizations is to still keep that an open system so that you can interact with it in a, in a very open way. Or um, we don't oversimplify things, for instance. So you still need a little bit of time. You still need to invest a little bit of time in it, read it, in order to um, draw your own conclusions. And this is really what we, what we want to do with our work, is that you can uh, take it in and then draw your own conclusions from that. Could you please elaborate on the differences of graphic design and information design, the bottom-up process of information design? Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> your turn. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, a while ago we, we did some infographics for for American Express, and uh, um, we had a 60-page contract to sign that we we do not mess up with the data, and uh, um, because it's it's uh, there's a basic difference between graphic design and uh, information graphics that you are in information graphics or uh, data visualization you are you you are you are linked or bound to the data which is underneath. So, for example, if you make an um, area, area chart of a, for a company for their annual report, um, and it's, it's going well, but the form or the shape of the area shape uh, of the area chart looks ugly to you as a graphic designer, it would be not be a good idea to change the shape. So, it's a, you really get into problems with that. 
So um, I think this is one of the, the biggest difference because every single element, like a, a type maybe even, or color or shape, has its own meaning. So uh, And once you have set the rules uh, for the game, you cannot change uh, these things because otherwise it's, it's getting completely unreadable. So uh, this might be one uh, bigger difference. Keeping chaos theory in mind, when do you believe you have enough data to satisfy your curiosity? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a big difference, uh, enough, da uh, enough data to satisfy our curiosity or our computers are capable of. So it's, uh, um, it's um, yeah, it's, um, if the data is complete or not, it's a really difficult thing to, 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 uh, to tell. So it's, uh, um, Sometimes we, 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 during the process, we, we learn that we, we got the wrong data. So, uh, and then we have to go back to the beginning and, uh, and start again to, 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 to do it. And sometimes the data which was sent to us, for example, to make an infographic or something, is, is faulty in some way. So a time ago, we had a, a project where it's a really nice uh, a theory that uh, in, a, in supermarkets, products where you can get a lot of calories for a low price are placed convenient. So that you can uh, uh, get in uh, a lot of calories for a low price while entering the supermarket, American supermarkets. Especially, yes. Yes, and it, it really does sound good. But, um, and so we asked them for the data and asked them for blueprints of Walmart and different uh, supermarkets. And then we calculated uh, 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 the calorie dollar ratio for, for every uh, single product. And then we mapped it on the, uh, on the supermarket as kind of a heat map. And it simply was not true. So it's, 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 it's not true, because there, there are products where you can get no calories for a lot of dollars, like uh, Fuji water, which is really expensive. And there, uh, um, and there are other ones which, which are really cheap, but you can get uh, no calories at all. So it's, it's, uh, it's, and then it's, it's really complicated because then we would go back into, uh, to, 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 to start the process again. But since it was for a newspaper or a magazine, and they had no time, and the story was written already. So you said, yeah, yeah, we, we, do, we do know. It's, it's not right, but just make the infographic. And, uh, and we said, yeah, but it's, it's not right. So it's, uh, and then they, said, they mailed back and said, yeah, then just make it 3D. And, it's, uh, it's, uh, and, uh, and uh, we said, yeah, but uh, it does not matter how many dimensions we are using, it, it stays wrong. So it's, uh, and and uh, the next emails we got was, uh, were with caps lock on. So it's, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and then we gave back the assignment because it's, uh, then it's, it's getting a little bit complicated because they asked, you tell something which is not completely right. So it's, um. You have mentioned that autonomy is an important quality in the process of your work. Any suggestions for the students who will enter the in industry on how to maintain the autonomy? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the autonomy of the designer, I suppose, then. Um, um, there's, I think that there's also autonomous processes within the, in the design process itself. Um, in our practice, we, we work a lot for clients, um, but we also do our own uh, free work. We haven't the the clock might sort of categorize in that or might be categorized like that a little bit. Um, but there's other other projects that we uh, that we frequently uh, do, or at least a few a year, where we work on something that is um, not related to you know to to a client or money, or we have no use for it e even. You know, we we made a uh, a wooden table. This uh, this last summer, uh, for instance, because uh, because we felt like it, and uh, we do is yeah it was really nice carpentry work and the and the weather was good. Um, it's um, uh, it's really important to us because when when we design um, many of the designs that we do are uh, based on a conversation that we have. You know, we used to work in separate locations. Now we have a, a location in Berlin and one in Arnhem. Um, but Daniel was once in, living in, in Rotterdam, and we were also separate there. And we were designing over the phone, basically. So discussing a book design is uh, over the phone is really difficult sometimes, even especially if you try to be uh, as detailed as possible, you know, about the kerning of headlines and things like that. Um, 
So this algorithmic, algorithmic designing, where you, where you basically talk about the process, not so much about what the actual, the, the, um, the final result might look like, is easier over the phone. But you need a certain vocabulary uh, to do that. You need to understand each other and, and, and uh, uh, speak the same language. And I think that in our studio, we, we do this really well. We, we have our own language. But if you have only so many words, I think that there's a risk of creating the same design over and over and over again, because you're constantly saying the same things to each other, and you need to refresh that. You need to talk about you know, things like that you never worked with before, like, like wood, for instance, and, and uh, try to carpent a table out of that when you're not, not a carpenter. So to step out of that, uh, step out of the normal, your normal routine work, uh, in our case, that tends to be the, uh, the projects that uh, are not for clients, because clients have deadlines and they have you know, plans with your work, and they, uh, they, sp they spend money on you, uh, so you, you have uh, certain obligations, and free work just doesn't have all that. You can just do whatever you want. And um, this is something that we, we both teach uh, in, uh, in Arnhem at uh, Artes, um, and we really encourage uh, students to do this. Everyone wants to go into a job or maybe start their own practice, but we also tell them to you know, do their own work on the site, basically. Yeah. <laughs>